All right. And Joe, just so you know, every like five minutes or so, I'm going to look at you and I'm going to say, Joe, just to get your opinion on on things, because we're going to be talking about some things that um I I don't think you've done a lot of reading into the topic. So, um, yeah, every now and then I'm, I'm going to ask you for your opinion and you've I'm going to give you 20 seconds. <laughs> And then we'll but, move on. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to a new, very exciting uh, installment of Club Moffat Talks. Uh, we're going to be talking about something I actually know about this this month, so that's exciting. My name is Chris, one of the instruction librarians here. I'm Joseph. I'm also an instruction librarian. And actually, we, we have a little bit of a shakeup today. Uh, Ryan decided to set this one out, and we are joined by Hunter. Hello, I'm Hunter. I'm the I'm the thank circulation manager. And joining us today is our very special guest. You want to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. My name is Brandon Blakesley. I am the I'm an instructor of history here at MSU, and I teach Latin American history. And I'll just be talking about my passion today rather than my my topic of study. That's very wonderful. Uh, so usually whenever we do these, we, uh, and I just realized you can see my giant stack of batteries over here in the corner. So I hope these look as threatening as they look here in the thumbnail. Um, so usually before we actually get into the topic, we like to go around and just kind of talk about like what we've been up to lately, like what kind of movies or games or books we've kind of been uh, delving into in our free time recently. So you want to start us off? Sure. Um, let's see. So movies i recently i drug my feet for a long time but i watched the gran turismo movie like <laughs> two weekends ago um because i was thinking about video game movies where i just don't watch them but i was actually surprised with how good it was and I, i've been disappointed by the director who's a south african director that i really enjoyed district nine but i thought that this was after district nine a good movie so if you're a fan of racing and or neil blog camp i would recommend gran turismo it's a blog camp movie it's a blog camp movie so that's, that's shocking i had no idea i never saw any mention of the director at all okay i think wow. it, they, they snuck it in at the end and because i per, i pay attention to the small little details um wow. i i saw that one so now uh that's what i've been watching i also um reading mostly for class which is boring stuff but on apple tv i've enjoyed um the foundation series that's coming out and discovered just season two just wrapped up that it's a David Gorey and Jane Espenson. And as a child of the early 2000s and the Buffy verse and the Angel verse, I like Jane Espenson shows. So I enjoyed that one greatly. All right. How much does that, is that accurate to the, the Isaac Asimov books or is it just like a kind of a take on it? How do we define accuracy? Um, it is essentially a lot of the the major points hit it so it, it's accurate within a framework but then they also adapt it to make it more cinematic so oh, there's okay. so it's not close accuracy but the big broad strokes are fairly accurate interesting yeah. um i haven't watched a video game movie i think i mean i've um i've watched the castlevania cartoon i, I thought that was pretty good um mm -hmm. i uh I don't think I actually have paid to see a video game movie since, um, well, Mario. Mario was good too, but um, I didn't pay for that. That was just on that was on Peacock or whatever. Uh, the second Silent Hill movie. Um, that was a um, that was an experience and one that I never wish to relive. Um, that that movie made me really upset. There's uh, I I always tell people, Pop Tart jump scare, and um, if they say. What do you mean by that? I just told him, don't worry about it. Just don't watch that movie. But yeah, those are that's good. Yeah, I'm I'm interested in in Foundation. I'd like to see that. Um, we don't have Apple TV, but yeah, that one's that one's been uh, definitely on my radar. Nice thing about that one is it's one of the cheaper ones, so hmm. there's less content in it because it is a cheaper one. But they still haven't jacked up the prices yet. So no, not yet. <laughs> uh, anything else? um no i mean unless you want me to talk about whatever history book i've been reading well you recently. can i mean you know if, if it's if it's really been we'll skip over that one <laughs> if i want it any other time i'll talk about the books that i'm reading okay. as well <laughs> that sounds good hunter i think this is i believe this is your first time being uh uh, uh co-host on this one yeah. do you want to talk about what you've been up to lately uh yeah sure i also watched castlevania nocturne 
the new. I haven't seen Nocturne yet. Oh, okay, never mind. Well, so I watched Castlevania Nocturne. It was very good. Uh, not as short as the first season of Castlevania on Netflix, but I think it was six or eight episodes. But oh. it does lead on a nice little cliffhanger at the end, and they did confirm season two. Cool. Uh, but as far as watching anything, I think that, and then this was weeks ago. I watched Netflix's One Piece because we got Netflix. And One Piece was very good. In yeah. all of its in all of its goofiness, it was a very very good show. And then as far as uh, books, I haven't been reading any books lately. I have a bunch of books I need to read. And then games, I've been playing through Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. I'm and, happy to hear that. Um, oh, <laughs> sorry, it's, it's Jay, Jason. I'm gonna beat him up. Beat him up after this. Okay, that's all. we'll all beat him. We'll 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 throw right, him out and kick him. Uh, anyway, so been playing through that, and uh, in anticipation of Super Mario, Super Mario Brothers Wonder, which comes out um, on the twentieth. You know what? There was a there was a demo at Target. There was. I, I was going. To, I was I was shopping with um, my family over the weekend, and I saw that that set up in a kiosk. And the very first thing I did was I went into the options menu to see if I could turn off that flower. <laughs> and did I was have... so happy. It's like one of the first you options of the flower nice. goes. Is it something I said? Yeah, so I like, that's hilarious. No, so I played. I did play the demo though at Target. I saw. I don't remember what day it was, but I was up early. Oh, it was Friday. I had to get up early to take my car and to get it serviced. Mm. And I was like, you know what? Let's talk about Target and see if they had the demo. And they did. And I played it. I got to the third war- third level. I got hit by an enemy, and then the demo kicked me out. Oh, wow. so it said I'm 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 too bad to keep playing it, but I'm very excited <laughs> for that. Skill based demos. Exactly. Um. Yeah, that one looks good. I I really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but uh, yeah, Nocturne, Richter mm-hmm. Belmont is so cool. Right? Oh yeah, I don't know anything about the show yet outside of that cliffhanger, but he's so cool, and I was so glad that because I thought it was strange that they went from Trevor to Richter because yeah. in the family tree that's a couple hundred years, but they didn't mess with the timeline of it all. So Simon's in there somewhere. He. He did exist at one point. They didn't mention him, but they did mention another. They mentioned Ju- Juiced. Juiced. Oh yeah. yeah, Harmony, Harmony fella. Yeah. yeah, he. Um. Yeah, his game is really weird, but yeah. Yeah. So he's mentioned, and so that means that this is following the actual like lineage that the yeah. game set up, which is good. Okay. I mean, you know, <laughs> if they want to skip ahead five hundred years, whatever. That's yeah. Fine. Yeah. So uh, anything else you got going on? We're not going to talk about Xenoblade because this isn't going to be the Xenoblade podcast. <laughs> that'll yeah. be that'll be the bonus episode. That'll be yeah. That'll be our eight hour uh, addendum to this one. Uh, and then also playing through Mario and Luigi plus was it Mario Luigi Superstar Saga plus Bowser's Army the, or the, something? Yeah. The tw- the fifteen word long. Yeah. Yeah, um, which I want to play that one too because they sped up the game, and that's mm-hmm. you know. Which that one's fun. I did not play the original. I played all the other ones except for that one in Paper Jam. So, yeah, I'm enjoying that game too. Well, cool. Well, that's good to hear. Bunch of Mario. I love Mario. Joe, what video games have you been playing lately? I have not lately played a video game. Mm. I was trying to remember the last video game I played, and I don't recall i think i think i may have played some version of smash brothers uh, Ah. with with the kids uh the game that i typically do is not a video game at all because i do tabletop role playing uh D &D with the fam a couple of times a month um so that's 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 the gaming thing um reading i have actually been able to do a little bit more reading i got back to reading my dresden books i think i'm on number seven now um and just because i like to pr- promote that they exist and stuff i wanted to point out that i just recently read this kid's book it's oh. uh, owl and penguin the best day ever uh vikram madan i believe is the author uh it's just a short little storybook and it's just sweet and adorable because it talks about friendship but it also talks about problem solving so it's a good i think feel like it's a good one um television i've been watching the latest seasons of things i watched uh 
the third season of Only Murders in the Building. I watched the second season of uh, Wheel of Time. Mm. Uh, and I've caught a couple of sequel movies uh, in the last couple of weeks. We watched uh, The Meg 2 and also Monster High 2. And the thing that I can say about both of those movies is that they're enjoyable, they're fun, uh, but neither of them is as, is as good as their original. Okay, did you see the Trolls movie? I have deliberately not seen the Trolls movie. I My don't daughter had a little have any intention like... of seeing the Trolls okay. movie. I will say this. I love Anna Kendrick, but she cannot make me watch that movie. <laughs> um, yeah, so my daughter has like a little, like a like a picture book that has like the songs from the movie in it. And it started to run out of batteries, uh, which is like a recurring theme. She also has a, uh, like a, a praying little lamb doll she got from her grandmother, I think think who knows anymore i don't know where all of her stuffed toys have come from and it's supposed to uh, do the now i lay me down to sleep mm -hmm. but like the battery is completely dead so like whenever it gets to i pray my lord it goes i pray my lord my soul to take and it sounds so scary and so i'm just like okay well all right but anyway um so i started watching the trolls movie because that one also the battery is dying for her. and um yeah they um the whole plot of that is that um, there's a fascist society of giant monsters that eat them, and they'll only be happy if they eat the trolls. So, like, the, the prince of the these guys is, is upset that he doesn't get a chance to eat the trolls because they have to migrate away to escape, like, total genocide. And, uh, and the little kid asks big king guy am i ever going to be happy now and he says look son no you'll never be happy with anything in your life and i was just watching this like i thought this was the cute trolls movie for kids but anyway um anything else you got going on uh stuff that we'll talk about when we get to things that are happening you know on campus later but no that's that that's that's mostly it okay uh, I don't have anything going on. My life is a, sp a spiral of darkness and uh, emptiness. It's because you haven't eaten any trolls. Yeah, I haven't eaten any trolls, but also because uh, it's just my daughter is starting to learn sentences. Um, <clears throat> recently, she started just like falling down on purpose. But she would just like just fall from a standing position. And I said, oh, don't fall down. So now her new thing is that she'll say, I fall down. And just run around the house saying, I fall down. She'll throw something and say, he fell down. Uh, uh, then we were watching the football last night. And every time someone got tackled, she'd say, he fell down. He fell down. That's it. That's my whole life. I uh, feel like she has a really good grip on football. Yeah, you know, that's all, that's all football really is, honestly. It's just people falling down. <laughs> anyway, so... It's actually we've we've been talking about what we've been doing for it looks about uh three times longer than we usually do. So I'm going to turn this over to Brandon. Uh you have a really interesting topic to to bring in today, and I'm I'm very excited to talk about this one. Sure. Um yeah. How much of a background do you want on this topic? Hey, as much as you want to give, there's actually quite a bit to talk about. There is quite a bit to talk about. Well, I'll introduce the topic and then we can, we can go from there. The general debate kind of in recent years is over intellectual property. So you have IPs and this counts as video games, series, things like that. And then the issue is um, with a copyright law. So who owns this material and how do you want to protect it? Because copyright law is good. It allows people, creatives to have ownership of the things they create. But then you also get people who see these ideas and then they start to, to modify the content. So if you think about it in terms of books, you have an author writes a book and then there's a community that grows up around creating fan fiction for the book. They take that idea and then they want to see where else the story would go. They complete it after the author and things like that. The same thing happens in the world of, of computer games and video games. And you get to this really interesting point where uh, earlier on in, in the early creation of video games, most content was kind of modified content. So you had the original Space War, which is created in 1960s, 
on a computer that was connected to ARPANET. And then other computers that were connected to ARPANET would take the source code for this game and then modify it to add new components to it. And this is the way things go. But then as gaming became in the late 90s and early 2000s, billions of dollar of industry, there was kind of this crackdown or protection of intellectual property because a, a AAA game or a blockbuster game takes a team of a thousand people five years to make. And then you don't want someone to just create a mod of it and steal your content. Mm -hmm. So basis is where does where do these things fit anymore? So and you know I've heard like the George R. R. Martin is like really, really down on fan fiction. Mm -hmm. Uh famously he like he and someone else I, i'm not sure who the other author was but they've been like vehemently like do not write fan fiction i don't want anyone to to write anything in my setting it may i mean it may accurately portray events that we're going to write about it may you know it may um be better than what i'm writing it may miscolor what it is that we're we're trying to portray in the first place you know it, it, for all sorts of reasons but that's one of those things that like you you absolutely can't can never like make a copyright stake on because that's you know that's a that's a derivative work it's not being sold it's not being presented anywhere but like these avenues that are strictly like presented as community made yeah. so that's when you start to wonder about the, the copyright law and where it comes into play True, or to connect, we've mentioned D&D &D before, and then I serve as an alternate for a D&D campaign. So like every other month, I get called up to, to participate. Yeah. But um, the the big thing with D&D &D, uh, a couple of months ago, for maybe a long time, was that I'm trying to copyright fantasy elements. Like, we're going to copyright dragons. So if you use dragons, you're infringing on our D&D &D copyright. And you're like, what? But these concepts existed long before you. You can't just slap your copyright on something that you've also stolen from other places. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you say, if like, if you do the exact hierarchy of dragons as they're presented, like in the in the dungeon manual or the, the monster manual, rather, then maybe they'd have an argument there, but you'd still have to really cover, like, they, co they, they copied the stats, they copied the, like, the exact wording otherwise yeah like what the, there's you don't have a, a leg to stand on with that it's like that those that group that tried to copyright the phrase react mm -hmm. on youtube yeah so well i can also say specifically with D, &D so many of the concepts that went into the game were stolen from other sources like tolkien's hobbit I mean, the whole idea of having, you know, fight fighting creatures uh, in their in their own lairs and their caves, uh, and then uncovering treasure, that's in in Tolkien's Hobbit. The idea of the dragon sitting on a hoard of gold. I mean, I'm not saying that he invented the the concept, but that's very much part of you know Tolkien's Hobbit. I mean, uh, halflings. So, uh, I mean the the existence of dwarves, elves, uh, halfling creatures, uh, hobbits, uh, the whole character class of a ranger, that's the hobbit. Mm -hmm. uh, so so yeah, you know if if you want to start throwing stones in that, where did this come from? That's going to get messy. I I don't think it's just D and D. I think Wizards of the Coast in general, like they did it with Magic the Gathering and a whole lot of stuff. I think recently. Well, even for Magic of the Gathering, part of what's, this is going to get off topic, but we're already off topic, so let's keep going. I mean, part of what you're doing with any card game is you need to keep creating new content. Otherwise, the meta gets stale and people stop mm -hmm. buying cards. And so Magic of the Gathering is now all the the specialty sets. Of, mm -hmm. This is the Lord of the Rings Magic the Gathering or the Harry Potter Magic the Gathering. And so... To find a way to keep it fresh and keep people purchasing the latest iterations. And and there's that one that's literally like it's the Lord of the Rings, and then they have Baldur's Gate, or, or like the Dungeons and Dragons set on the exact opposite side. So you play all of them together, and it's yeah, everything gets so muddied together. It, it's just so so bizarre. 
Yeah. Uh, there was one in particular you mentioned in an, in an email with us that I really was was interested in talking about, and that was um, modded games like Dota. Sure. Uh, well, we can get there. And so you have some of the, so with gaming, so we're talking about fan fiction or Dungeons and Dragons. And in some ways, these things are just added on or fanfic can help you come up with new game types or things like that. But in the world of gaming, modified content is what helps, which traditionally helped drive innovation in gaming. Um, and you have some early founders who kind of made space for modified content and kind of turn tools over to the players. And one of the first games that did, so, um, you could always hack a game, and you could always see the data, but to talk about Dota or even League of Legends, which was also a modified content for a previous game too, or even Counter-Strike, which was also a modified content. So if you look at the three biggest games in terms of esports tradition, they all have their origins in modified content hmm. created by people who are fans of other games. But that all goes back to, to Doom, the original Doom in 1993 made by id software not far from here uh, in louisiana <laughs> oh, at the yeah. time yeah but, i always yeah, forget now in dallas so i always forget that it's in dallas yeah so but uh when doom came out doom came out as a shareware concept so you never you didn't purchase an individual copy of it you downloaded it from this newfangled thing that most people had access to in 1993 the internet um or that the nerds had access to <laughs> but the difference about Doom was that um, John Carmack, who was writing the programming for it, he had a separate file with all of the skins and the level design. So he had the game engine, but then he had a separate file and he called them the WAD file, where's all the data. And the idea was that he made the WAD file open access for anyone who wanted to modify the content to Doom. And so you had people who had access to computers who were playing the game, they created their own levels. And then later on, since we're talking about Nintendo earlier, Nintendo monetized this by giving Mario Maker, which was a way <laughs> to do something that people were already doing anyway, but just to to make a game out of it. So, yeah, those those Kaizo Mario hacks, which which even then, whenever you compare those to what you can do with Mario Maker, a lot of those Kaizo hacks are even more like in depth and, and have a lot more like customizability to them yeah. so even with the official products that nintendo puts out there's a a less maybe user-friendly version that that is ac accessible but it's still one that has a lot of the same tools in it mm -hmm. even when the first one came out i think you couldn't do slopes and like a whole bunch of other things with the created levels so that came out it was nice to have this like kind of hub so you can download it officially from other people but yeah, like the the tools that people have had for like 20 years now were still technically better and more robust. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and that was, yeah. So to, to get back to Dota, uh, you had a gaming company that came out with the success of Doom. I mean, they like what Doom was doing, but they had a different genre, Silicon and Synapse, which eventually went through a name change and became Blizzard Entertainment which is much in the news if you're a fan of Microsoft Blizzard and or FTC regulations, then you might have heard about Blizzard. But um, they came out with a, a, their big game was Warcraft 2. Warcraft 2 sold a lot of uh, copies. They reskinned Warcraft 2 and made an online version of it and called it StarCraft. And then with StarCraft, you could have the base game, which is a campaign, but it came with what they had. A, a, they built in the mod tools to the game itself. And so you had a map editor, which would let you create your own textures and create your own maps. But you could also change the rules of the game. So the game would spawn you with a certain number of units, but you could completely change the rules of the game and create all your different and all your own game types. Um, and you could then, because of the internet with the rise of DSL technology, which allowed you to access the internet in a stable way without taking up a phone line, um, you had access to anyone who was playing the game. So I grew up abroad. I was a State Department brat, not a military brat, but <laughs> I grew up abroad. So I was playing StarCraft in Bolivia, but I could play StarCraft with anyone anywhere else in the world. Um, but what you could do is you could turn off the normal game types and use a use map settings to play a certain game type that that operated according to your own rules. Um, 
So that's the basis for modding. And then there's a, a game that's created called Aeon Strife, which rather than focusing on multiple units, you focus on a single unit over time and you kind of gain stuff through your single unit, which then uh, when Blizzard gets together and they want to make their next version of the game, they make Warcraft 3 and they add a even more robust map editor where you can change the sprites, you can change the, the rules anymore, you can change the attack patterns. And that's where you get the original Defense of the Ancient game, which was created for as a mod for Warcraft 3. Something I just I want to I want to also say there what's really, really fascinating about that is that it's in the game that you can just find the the Dota module like you don't have to download it from other things. It's in like if you look up user based games or user created content, it's just there in like their big list of stuff. So it's it's not quite like they're endorsing it. But they do have the tools available so that anyone playing the game also has access to it. Yeah, it's it's a version of the game itself. So it's the idea is that you continue to play the game and it gives you access and it's supposed to be used for this. It's not like Blizzard accidentally gave you tools or you had to hack the tools to get there. No, you bought the game and with the game was your opportunity to create your own use map settings or to play use map settings. So it was entirely designed for this in, in mind or for this purpose. So. Uh, and yeah, what's really cool about Dota is um, Warcraft, like any any of the the craft games, all the strategy games, is that the the main core of it is that you have your units that are gathering materials, and then you have your units that you're creating to like cr like have a war with another player, or if you're playing the the single player to like do objectives and stuff. And the big thing about Dota is that all of the the uh, material gathering is automatic so instead of having like you're you're producing more units to to harvest stuff you're creating more buildings to create better units or upgrade your units you're just playing one guy and that's just the one thing on your team and it's basically like playing a single player game as opposed to playing a multiplayer game except other people are playing the one character on their team too so it's it's much I would almost say easier, but it has different things that you're that you have to keep in mind rather than just your like your economy. Now you're worrying about building your character. So yeah. it's it's all it's like completely different, but it's still the same tools that you have in that game. Yeah, it's like if you take if you uh, so real time strategy games, which is the craft games, you had an element of. Um, like Sim City, so you're building up your own Sim City, which will let you construct all your buildings. And then you had an element of of fighting games where you create armies that you fight against other armies. And modders using the the materials or the the tools built into Warcraft Three or Starcraft said, "Well, what happens if we just have fighting games, but like a gladiatorial contest?" So what if it's just like one on one? I create the strongest person, and then we fight against the strongest person. And so you you get this completely new mod type. Or my favorite thing, I did not play a lot of Defense of the Ancients from Warcraft 3. I played a lot of Warcraft 3, but I liked there was um, Last Alliance game modes. So someone had created essentially a Lord of the Rings Last Alliance based thing where you could play as Mordor, you could play as Gondor, <laughs> you could play as Rohan. And there's stand-ins for all these figures. And essentially you got to play those. And I, I love that. I sunk hours hours of my time playing those map settings so just to cycle it back to to tolkien because why not that's so fantastic i, I didn't even know that was a thing yeah it's actually the it was the pinnacle of starcraft warcraft 3 didn't have as much but starcraft you had you could always look for certain game types that people would make but uh so i was wondering if you have um anything else relatively or even remotely positive to say before the comma but happens in this story or if, if we want to go ahead and get into the blizzard happened part sure. of it well okay so the comma but is i think you have the three original founders of, of blizzard um, including mike morheim and all those they they were the ones who really pushed to have these tools in the system and and they really they really kind of or this older idea from John Carmack of wanting to make sure that players could have access to all these tools. 
Um, and, then, and then what happens is not necessarily their fault, but you start to have success. You start to make money on these things. And so once you make money, then people want to make more money. Um, and so you start to see the the interest of making even more money kind of come in. And then now none of the three founders of Blizzard are still at Blizzard anymore. They either were forced out or they left to make their own games. So I think we often get um, the companies, we link them with the people that created them, but often they go off the rails because the people that created them have to leave or are pushed out or things like that. So before we start bashing Blizzard, I just wanted to, to make a plug for those guys who who created this and allowed us to have it anyway. Yeah, it's it's this isn't their fault. Yeah. <laughs> this, you know, that things happen. And it, ironically enough, now both uh, that company and uh, Idsoft, Idsoft bought out by Bethesda, Bethesda bought out by Microsoft. Microsoft owns all these now. Yeah. So I don't, we don't know if it's going to all be positive change or not, but um, uh, yeah, some, some things have been getting kind of rocky li uh, lately, but um, specifically with, with Insoft in, in relation to the user created stuff, uh, they would, they would actually tag some of the higher, like the more renowned people creating the user games and, would sell some of their products as like expansions to doom uh, uh i think the most the most famous one is um the plutonia experiment i think it's it's released as uh final doom or or ultimate doom or something like that and uh it's considered like the ending of of the doom like the old doom series um nowadays like the way that you would get those uh, they would have them in its own bundle eventually, but uh, before people would download the the WAD files, they would just download those and plug them into a program that loaded them like a Doom stage or a Doom level. And Doom levels are like mini levels inside of a big thing. But uh, nowadays they re-release Doom uh, to kind of to to play nicer on modern machines, but um, they have it. They they have a uh, like a mod installation tool inside of the game that you purchase where you can download stuff like the the final Doom maps and other types of user created content. So all that's free. Whereas th there's some stuff that kind of happens with Blizzard where it's still free, but it, it's it's complicated. But Idsoft or what's left of them are actively trying to to put those user created tools in people's hands it, it seems like so we're going to start seeing a big shift in how user created tools are approached here well yeah i hope so because yeah <laughs> well especially in this story too it's things get a little different with with blizzard yeah so think well if we want to go for the butt the the butt happens here and the butt could happen in two places um you have, since these are user created content, you have people who run Dota All Stars or create the Dota All Stars version, and they're the ones who have all the technical know how. Um, and so you have a couple people that design Dota uh, known by their gamer tags, not necessarily by their real names. People like Yule or Ice Frog that are associated with it, or Steve Feek. Um, and Steve Feek is one of the original creators. And what happens? So what happens, Dota is really popular. Thousands of people log on to Warcraft 3 not to play the game as intended, but to play Defense of the Ancient. And then some enterprising game studios like, say, Riot Games says, we want to create our own version of this game type. And so we're going to hire Steve Feek, for instance. And Steve Feek is going to come over to us and design a game. And we'll get around copyrights by calling it League of Legends. And so League of Legends started off its life as Dota. Um, Steve Feek was making the Dota content. Riot Game wants to make their own game. They hire him out and they make the game, which Blizzard is like, nah, it's a different enough game. You're not using the same models. It doesn't have the same name, whatever. The economy stuff is totally taken out too. Like even in the background, yeah. like there's no economy stuff. So yeah, yeah. But but this is also the game is modified enough that people who like Defense of the Ancients or like the economy stuff, they're, they're not super happy with it. It's just too different of a game from the game they like. Um, and we don't have time to talk about Heroes of New Earth, but 
let's get to the juicy bit, which is when Valve, which is a company renowned for Half-Life and Half-Life 2, who have its own history, Valve, what they've done is they generally, uh, while they don't encourage modding, they will hire modders to come and make a standalone game. So their biggest game at the time, the Half-Life series, spawned one of the, the uh, most successful esports of all time, Counter-Strike which was two modders who went into Half-Life and then they turned a single person, first person shooter game into a multiplayer game. And rather than trying to slap them with copyright infringements, Val's like, did you just want to make a standalone game <laughs> for us? We'll hire you if you want to make a game. Um, and so what Valve does is Valve sees that people want a defense of the ancient games. They look at the people who make it and they're like, well, we're going to hire this guy called Ice Frog and we will just make a game called Dota. Um, and so we'll call our game Defense of the Ancients. It'll run on the Steam platform rather than in Warcraft 3, which gives us more tools to run the game. And we will create that. And that's when Blizzard says, well, hold up a second. You're essentially stealing our game mm -hmm. because you're calling your game Defense of the Ancient. That's like our game. A lot of the characters are named the same thing. You have the same basis. You are stealing your game or you're stealing our game. And Valve says, no, we're not stealing your game. You don't own it. This was created by these modders. We are paying the people who created the game using your engine to make our own game that will eventually have our own engine too. And so that's the, the story of, of Dota 2. And then a lengthy lawsuit between Blizzard, which has the funds to lobby a lawsuit against a company and Valve who has the funds to defend itself against the Blizzard lawsuit. So and um things are things are really weird about original Dota now. Um I don't know if you wanted to talk about that, but it's one of the it's it's probably the thing in this story that that piques my interest the most because my my main interest even in just librarian terms is in preservation I, mm -hmm. I think that we really really need to focus on digital preservation because things things are starting to disappear uh there was a report recently that like 91 percent of all games that have ever been made can no longer be bought legally like it's it's a big problem and then i um uh, one of our uh one of my co-workers actually came in here earlier and we were talking about um counter-strike because the most recent version of counter-strike uh csgo doesn't exist at all it can't be played anymore because they replaced it with counter-strike 2 um and you know what there's actually a really funny thing i this is just a, an observation but valve um valve has a game called team fortress which is kind of based on on the half-life engine i think it's still the source engine um it's big thing is that you play like these very distinct characters that are like they have their own personality and their own play styles blizzard turns around and makes a game called overwatch which is they're big uh five versus five shooter that has these characters that are larger than life and they're like it's it's almost as if they're saying okay well we can do okay you can you think you can do dota we can do counter or not counter sorry we can do team fortress and it's it's now the lowest rated game on steam <laughs> um but uh, uh no my my thing that i really think about here is um like we were we were talking about Counter Strike, and I was mentioning because she came in here to talk about uh, something in our DVD collection, and I just said like this thing, right? This DVD that I'm holding is going to degrade and disintegrate in in some amount of time. It's called disc rot. It's going to happen. Um, it's and it's inevitable, really. Like if if you had movies or CDs or anything in one of those um, like binder cases, I I challenge you to stomach an experience of looking at what those look like right now because they're probably going to be completely see-through like those don't those won't exist anymore and as those games are not available for purchase they're not being produced anymore i think like the only company who still produces playstation one games is square enix they still reproduce some final fantasy games but outside of that like they're going away forever and it's it's like an epidemic almost um but the well, thing that's really fun. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you going to say something? Well, uh, they're either going away or they're being replaced because one of the mm -hmm. things to that companies and Valve is now one of these companies is trying to do this as well with um, Counter-Strike 2.0, which I don't know a whole lot about Counter-Strike 2.0. That is more modern than my Counter-Strike playing <laughs> days. Um, 
is that you you release new versions of it with new source files so that you can override all those old source files. So one of the things that Blizzard did was they went through and um, they re-released -re Warcraft 3. The idea was they were going to give it a modern facelift, but, but really one of the things they were doing was they destroyed the old game and you couldn't access the old game anymore. So if you had built any and created any content in the old game, it was destroyed when you had to update the old game to get the new game. And that was one of the one of their ways to kind of assert control over the modding tools that they had given freely to a bunch of people, but now regretted because they lost however much money Dota has now produced for Valve and not for Blizzard. That's that's the that's the comma but I really want to talk about because okay. that's this is the part where where Blizzard goes from questionable decisions to outright evil corporation because when they when they did their their remaster of Warcraft three before you could tie one of their older games to your account it wouldn't be within like the main like game launcher that they have Joe yes do you have any input not 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 really. I mean, I'm sorry. I told you I was going to do it. I you told you I was going to did. do it. I'm you you, you um, haven't done it with the frequency you said you were going to do it. Which I know. Is fine. I'm sorry. I got too. But, I got uh, too scared. I'm sorry. What I mean, I, um, I I I played a little WoW and I enjoyed it, but I also very distinctly distinctly recall playing the original Warcraft with no numbers or additions, just Warcraft mm -hmm. on a disc that I stuck into my computer. And I got to either play a human or a not human. And I started off chopping down trees to build a house. And mm -hmm. then, you know, oh, and then I could chop down a few more trees and, you know, make a little tribal hut that would eventually generate more people, you know, and, and that thing. And I remember... Well, so you actually, you do have some, like, you can see where we're coming from, where we're talking about this. I, I do, I can, okay. you know. Yeah, but, yeah, I... I, I don't have the I don't have the experience of playing that you do because I have not played those games, some of them at all, and the others not to the extent that you have. Uh, and that's, then, that's what we're I mean that's why we're here talking about it because yeah, so, this is an actual you know this is a, a topic of concern especially with sure. libraries that a lot of people probably don't even know is a problem but it's like. Uh, it, it is and also hunter um we've been steamrolling you this whole time too do you have anything you want to add or... I'm, gl I'm glad i could contribute to this uh, okay. to this podcast episode okay that's wonderful oh. but um but back to what i was saying was that um so blizzard changed that version of warcraft 3 so even if you have the old one whenever you install it it automatically updates the game so you have to have their new version there's no way to get back to your old one unless you install it from a disc which my computer doesn't even have an optical drive so there there's no way to get back to that one this new version that they forced you to download is 10 times the file size of the other one from three gigabytes to 30 um we, uh, Brandon, you said it, it's it's modern, but I think it looks so much worse that it's not even comparable. Like it doesn't even look like the same game anymore. It, like the art style, in particular, is is atrocious. It looks so ugly. Um, but the really the really insidious thing comes in the form of their uh, of their user tools. They they now have a stipulation where if you submit one of like these these user created maps or one of these like uh, something like Dota where it's like a new function of the game they own it like flat out they own your your product now like it's not just a mod that you made it's something they can exploit and create a product on and they don't have to credit you at all because you created it in their system and it's one of the scummiest most disgusting things i've ever seen one of these companies do and ea talked about having uh like charging you to reload your gun in like battlefield or something and even then i'm like okay I don't have to play Battlefield. If I put my work into the old version of Warcraft 3 and I resubmit it and you say you own it now, that's that's flat out like that's theft. That's labor theft. It's it's horrible. That's my big comma but. I'm so I'm so annoyed by the fact that that even exists. It's 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 awful. I don't know if they went back on it or not, but I can only hope they have. 
Uh, no, they didn't because, uh, yeah. Well, because after the initial download, people realized what this was and, and people who really loved the game or loved Warcraft 3. And Warcraft 3, so just to talk about a game that we're talking about, Warcraft 3 came out in 2003. So people were still playing Warcraft 3 and Reforged came out in, oh boy, I'm going to... 19, 20? Yeah, 19 or 20. It was sometime, it was very recent. sometime around that. But you still had a fairly sizable active player base that was playing essentially a 20-year-old game. Um, but then when Reforged came out, that number dropped precipitously. And one of the reasons they were playing a 20-year-old game is because with um, the use map settings, with the mod tools, you could create new campaigns. You could advance the story if you wanted, and people could download that content. There was a bunch of ways that you could do it. The The main issue, and this is the comma button, this is the, the problem that needs to be solved, was even though there's a lot of interest in playing that old game, there was no way to monetize that. So you're having essentially people playing a 20 year old game that they paid 60 bucks for back in 2003, and they have gotten 20 years out of pl a play out of it. Um, one of the things that Riot Game figured out how to do was to monetize people playing the game. Why you monetize the new content that comes out. If you want the new content, you have to purchase it. So as long as you keep making new content, you could keep the game um, profitable. And and Blizzard not find a way to do that. And so they were they were losing revenue. So I'm not disagreeing that there's a scummy thing. It is a scummy thing. <laughs> but this is the problem is one you need to find, or what companies are trying to do is they're trying to find a way to one, provide access to those games, but then two, to kind of make sure that it's is monetized or that it that it makes money. Um, and it's not just for like this is it's usually towards user created stuff. Like there's um, before we even started, I was talking about emulation and how it's like it's really it's really important. Um, sometimes with emulating uh, created properties, companies like Nintendo or or whoever else may come down really quickly with a DMCA or digital management, digital copyright, management. whatever thing, yeah. something like that. Uh, and they'll say like, okay, well, you've created a derivative uh, of our product using our characters, possibly with the tools that, that we've already created. So you need to take this down immediately because otherwise we are going to consider it as a infringement of our, of our copyright of our, in a, in a, of our IP, um, which even then, like it's if it's not being sold for profit, if it's obviously not by the company, then there are legal like steps to take there. But Nintendo is so huge, and the people making this are just fans. They just they just love the the property enough to make derivative works. Like they don't have the time, the resources, anything like that to combat those legal challenges. It's just that you just have to accept that that's that that's over. Like. Hopefully, people have made backups or or some sort of uh, digital preservation of what you've done, especially if it's like a, a really great fan-made project. The only thing that you can hope for is that other people have backed it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, the irony of Nintendo doing that, and I don't know, Hunter, if you know what the irony of Nintendo going after people creating uh, for copyright infringement is? Um, I don't know about the irony. I know that they're really no notorious for doing it. Okay. Well, th sorry. Th that's a professor thing. I try to ask oh. the audience to get them <laughs> Does this have to do with Popeye? <laughs> this has to do with Popeye. <laughs> okay, so I do well, know the irony then. I don't yeah. know this. Well, okay, so there's two ironies of it. One, there's Popeye, and then one is how it gets changed too. Go mm -hmm. for 100. You know this. Oh, so the, so the Popeye thing, if I'm incorrect me if I get anything wrong, because I probably will. But when, who was it, Shigeru Miyamoto, when Nintendo was getting into making arcade games, they wanted to make a Popeye arcade game. And they weren't, I don't know if it was like they weren't able to, or they didn't do the proper things. So basically they couldn't use Popeye characters. It was going to be Popeye, Bluto, and Olive Oil. So rather than scrapping the concept, Shigeru Miyamoto made his own original characters, who was Mr. Video, who would be named Jumpman, who would then be named Mario. Um, after their uh, warehouse lawyer, or no, warehouse, uh, their warehouse guy, I don't remember, his landlord, um, 
it was Mr. Video, it was Lady who would later be named Pauline, and then it was Donkey Kong. Yeah. So so they did it to get around because they couldn't get the rights to Popeye. So they had mm -hmm. the original sprites for Popeye, Bluto, and Olive Oil. They had to change the sprites over because they didn't have the rights for it. And then when they came out with the original Donkey Kong, oh, they, get, yeah. they get sued yeah. by Universal Studios. <laughs> yeah, they get Universal Studios says you have stolen, you have stolen King Kong. Yeah. We have That's we've so owned wild. The which also fun fact on that their lawyer's name was John Kirby and that's who Kirby's named after. <laughs> yeah, and and, and with King with the with Donkey Kong, it's not because they were going for King Kong. It's just that Miyamoto literally thought that Kong meant monkey, or something yeah. like that. Like he he thought that it meant uh, stupid stupid monkey or something. Uh, it's just it's such a weird, just the whole interaction between legalities between mm -hmm. like countries and and cultures and stuff is like yeah and the results get even weirder because why nintendo so universal has a huge team of lawyers nintendo is just starting out this is going to be their first big hit so they don't they're not nintendo as we know them today and so jack kirby brings his his legal case and his legal case was the fact that universal had never actually trademarked king kong <laughs> so they nice. get out Nintendo skates because Universal has not trademarked King Kong as their IP. And that is what allows Nintendo to produce the Donkey Kong game. So it's the same reason why people can do the, the Night of the Dead, Night of the Living Dead thing is because they just forgot. Yes. Yeah. I had that's, no, this is this is incredible. I had no idea. I didn't know that last part. That's hilarious. Yeah. So that's that's the important one. And that kind of brings us back to the importance of kind of allowing people to run with it or not being super strict about it is that back to the original thing the things that made all these things popular was someone seeing something in the game and saying you know what would be cool so the very first like multiplayer game is a doom hack so someone mm -hmm. hacked doom because doom was a single person game where you just play together but they enabled you to run a kind of network system on it so you have the first multiplayer game out of a hack from doom and rather than coming down against people people are like this is great we should run with it we'll make this part of quake when when id software comes out with quake and this is one of the standards for quake and and so on and so forth so allowing they people built to... off of they built off of that too because quake plays way it's way faster it's way more fluid specifically because they were building it with multiplayer in mind yeah yeah so this is not that um, modding content is not a sideshow for gaming. It's how gaming innovates and how it keeps mm -hmm. moving forward, even way back to the original Donkey Kong. So, yeah. you know. my big uh, thing has always been on translations. I think like a a pretty big majority of the games that I've played in the last year or two have been fan translations of stuff that we just never got. Like uh, Mother Three, the, the second Earth or the tech, I guess the the game after Earthbound. That game is stellar, and I'm so shocked that Nintendo would never bother with it. Like, um, I talked about Fire Emblem. Did you know that the original creator of Fire Emblem actually created a game called Tearing Saga because he didn't like the way that Nintendo was going with it? Uh, it, re it released on PlayStation, and they sued him and his new company because it, it played similar. Uh, they still allowed it to get sold, but because it was a like a competitor it was like the only game of its type that was like Fire Emblem. Nintendo successfully sued them. Like, yeah, all this stuff is just so, it's so bizarre. And we really do, I think, need people who are spirited and passionate and actually know the law and have an interest in keeping this stuff going. Like, like I want to I want to go back and play the original Dota. Um, I want to play Flappy Bird. I never got to play it. But that guy took it down and it's just gone forever. Like... I think video games are just as much of a piece of of cultural media as anything else. Like uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to say whether or not they're like full art forms or whatever. I think they are, but you know, there are arguments against it, whatever, but we we're, we're not ever going to get to a point where we can talk academically about certain things or um or be able to even reference certain material if we can't legally own them. Like it's it's really important just to just to speak about them in an academic sense so uh yeah i don't have a whole lot left to add without without actually finding a soapbox to get on and start yelling at it but yeah um 
uh, Brandon, is there anything else positive that you'd like to say about this whole this whole scenario? Well, um, I'd say one of the positive things about the scenario that I see is that you have, if you asked me back in the early 2000s which way gaming was going, it was to these AAA games that are made by a thousand people and then it take five years. So what was our hope for, for StarCraft? It was StarCraft 2 and then hopefully StarCraft 3 that would come out and so we could get this content. But one of the things that's been really nice and this is about the expansion of the internet, about the expansion of tools, is that you get the rise of indie gaming. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is not the, the indie gaming is the end all be all, but indie gaming becomes this avenue for a team of three people to be like, you know what, we wanna make this fun game type that's based off of something else. And the tools are now there to our disposal that we can kind of, not easily, but we can publish our own game and we can use various different um, online marketplaces to do it. Now, if it's just Steam, then that's a problem because Valve gets too much of a cut. But now that Epic Games has their own and most people are coming out with their own digital studios or digital marketplaces, that's a better way to say it. I think we, we're starting to see indie gaming and indie games being a, a way for these content creators to to one, create content that they like and to own the content, own their rights. And so um, I think with, with the mid thousand, with the mid aughts, you start to get this. And in any games are some of the games that I always look forward to the most coming out because they tend to be the most innovative in, in gameplay and game style. So that's Absolutely. my positive thing. No, I, I think that's a, a really good point because you, you see a bunch of developers from studios that have left for creative differences and you have like a, the creator of Castlevania, or the later Castlevania games, not the original creator. Big guy in the Castlevania development team says, okay, I'm just going to create something new because Konami kind of destroyed their entire gaming division. So he creates Bloodstained. It's basically Castlevania Symphony of the Night with new characters. Um, the, the the company Platinum, they can't get anyone to fund uh, a wonderful 101 remaster, so they say, hey, we're basically independent. You want us to fund our own recreation or our own remaster of this one game we have. And uh, what I really appreciate the most about seeing these success stories from just, I mean, there was a, a game recently called Sea of Stars that came out and its whole thing was, it was, it's like a throwback to Chrono Trigger um, or this, the style of games like Chrono Trigger. And it looks, it's sprite based. It's just like a classic SNES era RPG. And you also can see where Square Enix has this whole development team trying to emulate the style of those Super Nintendo games, and they fail every time because they just don't have the heart and soul in it. But what we're seeing, what the market is saying, is we don't need these giant, super polished, like, years-long development games with, like, uh, ray tracing, and, like, you can see the pores and beads and sweat off of people. We just want to see something that looks cohesive and pleasant, and is something that we genuinely enjoy playing and and interacting with. Like a uh, uh, Hunter said, he's been playing uh, Xenoblade Definitive Edition, and that game is ugly as sin. But they are some of my favorite looking aesthetic, at least games, probably on the market right now. I love the way those games look. So that's one of the the funny little like uh, like jabs at these big developers is you really don't have to waste that much money or that much time on these things. You just make a product that people want to play. And that's what we're seeing a lot of with indie development. And I appreciate that so much. Well, Brandon, I, I want to sit here and talk for another six hours about, about the gaming history and stuff, but unfortunately it's been, a, it's been at least an hour now. And we, the, our uh, guest speaking, allotment is like 30 minutes so um uh at, at this point i'm just gonna say uh, i i we had such a great time speaking with you come back on whenever you want and is there anything else you want to talk about anything you'd like to plug um that would be great if i had that planned i don't have that plan that's fine you know, <laughs> that's okay take my classes if you're at msu now um please yeah, come to the library. Library is important. Library is really valuable. I tell all my students, well, my students ask me where they can find a book, and I always shake my head a little bit and like, have you heard of the library? Um, so, uh, but no, thank you guys for having this podcast, and thank you guys for your uh, concern for preservation. I, 
I'm a historian. So kind of having preservation, have these old files, having these file formats that we can access in secure forms of media or taking the effort to convert them to whatever we need to convert them to is, is always good because some of these old games generate new ideas as well. Oh, absolutely. So, but yeah. It, yeah, it's it's just as important as having copies of, of old books that, that still get referenced or there's intertextuality to them. It's all the same. It's like it it just might take a different form, but it's all the same as it's ever been. Um Hunter, yeah. I know that we didn't give you a lot of opportunities to speak. <laughs> or, was there was there any point that you wanted to make about the the whole mod thing and stuff? Um, I was going to say we were talking about Nintendo suing people. I was going to say they're very infamous for that, but Pokemon Company is even more so mm. for completely shutting down fan games and whatnot. But because of indie games like Brandon had mentioned, now you have people that are kind of able to make the games that they wanted when they were younger. And you're seeing a large rise of like monster collecting indie games, mm. which are inspired by Pokemon, Shimigami Tensei, Digimon, all that kind of stuff. But then also like Paper Mario inspired games are becoming really big as of like to where there's a whole dedicated community of Paper Mario inspired indie games. Hmm. The Bug Quest, is that the one? That... Yeah, Bug Quest, there's yeah. Born of Bread, there's uh, another one I think about Witches, but there's just a ton of them, especially because after the second Paper Mario game, Thousand Year Door, they completely changed the formula up and people didn't like it understandably so and the only way to play thousand year door was to either have it on gamecube already or sell out like 130 to 200 dollars for a used copy and at that point the money's not going to the developer yeah like the people who made it nintendo they're not seeing that money they just yeah and then yeah, because they... nintendo had a whole like campaign about shutting down rom sites like i remember there used to be one we used to go on called the cool roms and oh, Nintendo, know. I think they sued or something, and Core Arms had to take down all of their Nintendo stuff mm -hmm. on there. So it became like impossible to play this game that became such a cult classic. Now it's getting released again for the Switch next year sometime. Which they do that so, too, because yeah, it keeps it keeps the the ability to to purchase them yeah. in the loop. But, but just those sort of things. But also on the flip side of that, Sega is a company that very much embraces the fan creation stuff to an extent to where like sonic mania which was sort of like a i guess a celebration of classic sonic games was developed by a guy who used to make sonic fan games hmm. there's and a new game by by his studio that's coming out too that they have yeah i saw that one the looks she, she yo yo or something it looks fun that was on an indie direct for nintendo yeah but um like they're very i don't think they're like super pro it but they're like if they whereas nintendo if, if nintendo or pokemon company sees a fan game they're gonna send you a dmca they're gonna get you to shut it down like that was the big joke is that like you never advertised your fan product for pokemon mm -hmm. because it would get shut down right away sega's like hey why don't you come make the next game for us they made a yakuza tie-in called uh streets of kamarocho it was just streets of rage with uh yakuza characters in it and nice i, I think it was a fan game and you just buy it on steam for like a month yeah. i have it yeah but that was uh that's what i wanted to kind of add in there so uh, it's I, I love nintendo but their practices suck and uh sega's cool yeah yeah uh, then there was there was also like pokemon with a gun oh yeah in pokemon's <laughs> pokemon's even worse like nintendo's yeah. bad pokemon's even worse to where like you'll have a there was one fan game called pokemon uranium yeah, i uranium. think it it had just come out and i want to say a week after they got a dmca it was in the same week as uh, the Metroid 2 remake. Yeah. The remake that, that was in development for 10 years by mm -hmm. one guy. Yeah. Um, and they said, well, you used a, an asset or two from Metroid Zero Mission, so shut yeah. it down. Get it, get done with it. Um, yeah. Take it down forever. So here's the lesson I'm, here. If you're going to make a Nintendo or Pokemon fan game, don't advertise it. Yeah. Just shut up about it. Yeah, shut up. But but if you're gonna advertise it, advertise it locally. Look, if you're in the area, if you're on campus, you can put posters up here for it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we'll, whatever. We'll, Just advertise. We'll, we'll your advertise phone. your your fan game for you. Just not online. Yeah. Um, Joe, did you want to talk about any community events, anything that's going around on campus right now? Yes, and this this month 
I have my paper sheet that I can shape. Can you can hold on? Can we all can we all like stack paper? our papers? Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Uh this is our things to mention for October. Uh and before I go into it, I'll just say if any of you have an event that you'd like us to mention, or if you have any comments or questions or suggestions for the folks here at the podcast, just zap an email to library at msutexas.edu. Um, if you want more information about any of the things that I'm about to mention, or just other things going on uh, on campus or around the community, you can check out the events section of the MSU Texas homepage or the calendar at discoverwichitafalls.com slash events. Having said that, uh, this month, you can check out some spooky fun on stage. Backdoor Theater is performing Puffs, and the Wichita Theater is producing Into the Woods. Uh, here at the library, we're bringing the therapy dogs back for midterms. Uh, dogs will be in our atrium from 6 to 7.30 on Monday, October 16th, and again on Wednesday, October 18th. So you can pet some puppies and relieve some of that testing stress. Uh, Moffat Movie Madness will show the film Stand and Deliver at 7 p.m. on the in the atrium on Thursday, October 19th. Uh, also, the library is the location for Tabletop Terrors, which is the gaming club's annual night of board games and spooky contests. Uh, there, that event will be on Friday, October 20th. Uh, MSU's homecoming week begins Sunday, October 22nd. Also, Moffat Library is hosting Rooftop Heroes, which is a celebration of fictional heroes in all their forms. Uh, this pop culture mini-con begins at noon on October 31st. We'll have speakers from across the campus with special presentations, including Trachtmann, a Germanized superhero comic, the changing aesthetic of superhero comics from the Golden Age to postmodernism, and the Legion of Doom, the scientific truth behind the most powerful and sinister group the world has ever seen. We'll close out the afternoon with a costume contest. The entire event is open to the public, but participants in the costume contest must be current students, staff, or faculty. Uh, we don't have any genre restrictions for that costume contest, but we do ask that you keep your costumes PG rated. Then on November 9th, please join us here at the library for our book plating ceremony where we will be honoring the faculty that have uh, been tenured and promoted. And that's it. Uh, I do want to point out, yeah, we we did change the date for um, for Tabletop Terror. This was something that was not decided easily, but we spoke with the gaming club and we all kind of came to the conclusion that to deliver a better, uh, a better event, to be able to have just uh more fun little activities there we decided i mean no one's gonna probably look at this and be upset that we made it uh happen sooner right um just the thing though is to keep in mind yes we did change that from uh october 31st to october 20th so if you're interested in that please mark that on your calendar that it's going to be a little bit earlier than it would have uh the last time we mentioned it all right uh and i think that will do it for this installment of Club Moffat Talks. Brandon, thank you so much for coming in and speaking with us. This is such a such a fascinating topic. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate being here and talking with all of you guys. All right. All right. Anyone want to add anything else? All right. I don't think so. I think we're just about ready to head out. So thank you all for listening, and we will see you on the next one.